Hey guys, today we're gonna to talk about drawing conclusions about a population, and we're really gonna talk about the wrong way to draw conclusions using an observational study, okay? With that being said though, I do wanna briefly talk about the right way to draw conclusions about a population. Number one, you can only make generalizations about a population based on samples that are randomly selected or otherwise representative of that population. What does that mean? Okay, when we wanna, as statisticians, we wanna draw conclusions about a population, right? Well, typically we don't ask every single person in the population when we wanna get data. The reason for that is that's just a long, extensive process and mistakes happen, it takes a lot of money. So often what we do is we grab a sample, we grab data from that sample, based off that data, then we draw conclusions about the population. Well, we need that population to be random, or I mean, sorry, that sample to be random, right? Quick story, I make a pot of chili. I put in the spices at the end. I forget to mix it up. Why? My kids were fighting downstairs. I had to run down and break it up. My husband walks in the door. He takes a spoonful of that chili. He says, ooh, it's so spicy. That bite wasn't represent. That sample was not representative of the whole crock pot of chili, that population of chili. Why? Because it wasn't mixed up. I forgot to mix it up, okay? If I would have mixed it up, that sample that he had would have been representative of the whole population. Okay, random sample, number one. Number two, you can only use a sample to make generalizations about the population from which the sample was selected. If I take 100 students at Armstrong and I ask them, uh, what's their favorite math class? I find 33% of them love math. Or I'm sorry, what's their favorite class at Armstrong? 33% of them love math. I can't say 33% of all students in the state of Minnesota or in the country or all teenagers love math. Why? Because my sample came from Armstrong students, so I generalized about Armstrong students then. Number three, it is not possible to determine a causal relationship between variables used using data collected in an observational study. Excuse me, it's a lot of words there. I can find a relationship between just about anything, okay? Just about anything. But we can only determine a cause and effect relationship through an experiment, a well-designed experiment, not an observational study. Okay, three principles of drawing conclusions about a population. Let's talk about the wrong ways to draw conclusions about a population. Well, one way we draw conclusions about a population is through a sample survey. Many of you have taken a sample survey. Now, there are sample surveys in many different forms, and sometimes we find them online. You could go to you know, ESPN, who's the best wide receiver in the NFL right now, and click on your answer. Um, but sample surveys like that online can be biased. Why? Well, it's a voluntary response sample. It consists of people who choose themselves by responding to general appeal. You're, that online poll, I may go on ESPN to check a score because I do like sports, but I don't know sports well enough to care about who's the best wide receiver. I maybe just want to see how the Vikings did, okay? How the Timberwolves did, whatever. But again, I'm not going to necessarily vote on who's the best wide receiver because I don't care one way or another right? It only, people only respond if they, if they truly are passionate about it. Now, here's an example that you talked about in your breakout room where radio pulls listeners on a controversial issue by asking listeners to call into the station, right? Okay, here's the deal. Here's a controversial issue for you. Fox News creates an online poll to record the proportion of adults who support gun, gun control measures by Congress. Typically, Fox News tends to be more conservative. Historically, conservative people are not in favor of gun control. Not all, but some, okay? Not all, I'm not making a blanket statement for everyone. I mean, you wanna be really clear on that. Okay, so based off those two things we just said that Fox News is typically more conservative and historically, not all, but conservative people will not support gun control, okay? Will not, because they believe in their, I think it's their Second Amendment rights, right? Okay, so how are they gonna vote then? 
The proportion of people who say, no, I do not support gun control measure may be a lot higher than if we did it with a random sample, okay? Than if we did it from a random sample, okay? Because those people are really, they really care. They're going to vote. They're passionate about the issue, okay? They're passionate about it. That's why we need a random sample. Voluntary response samples do create bias, what is bias? bias if a bias design shows bias if it systematically favors certain outcomes. So there might be way more no's than normal or way, way more yeses than normal. When we talk about bias, we want to talk about the type of sample that leads to bias, okay? What direction the bias is going as well and why. So for example, with this Fox News one here, right? We say the Fox News poll is biased because it is a voluntary response sample. That's the type of sample that leads to bias. Viewers of Fox News are typically more conservative and typically people who are conservative are against gun control. Okay. As a result, the proportion of people who responded to the poll and support gun control will most likely be lower. Hmm. Oh, and support gun control, right? Because they're going to not support gun control. So the people who support gun control will probably be lower than if we did this randomly, okay? We'll practice this more together. You'll get plenty of practice in your worksheet as well. Another bias sample is a convenience sample. Choosing individuals who are easiest to reach. You talked about this in your breakout rooms. You were trying to conduct a survey of students within a school district to see if you should cut funding to the athletics department to save money. You stand at the door and ask the first 20 people at the game um, and ask them a question. Do you think we should cut funding to the athletic department to save money for the school district? How do we think that's biased? Well, okay, it's easy to go to the football game. The football game at any school typically, right, generates the most money, the most, the highest, um, number of visitors or attendees, right? So it's easy to go there and get people's opinions because there's going to be a lot of people from the community there. However, how is this bias? Well, look, the first 20 people usually that go to the game are the, are the diehards. What are they going to say about cut funding? No. So the proportion there that you're going to get of people who say no is most likely going to be higher, right? than if we did it randomly in the community. Convenience sample, standing somewhere, just asking people questions. This, uh, this right here, I just said, this survey is biased because it is a convenience sample. The proportion of people who said no to the question is most likely higher than if this was done on a random sample from the community. This is because the first 20 people who go to the game will probably like sports more and as a result, want to vote no to cutting money for the athletic department. Again, I talked about the type of bias, which direction compared to if it was done randomly is gonna be higher or lower, and why is that? All right, let's move on. So more sampling errors. Now keep in mind, sampling errors come from the act of taking the sample. A researcher wants to know what proportion of coffee drinkers would pay more than $5 for a coffee drink. The researcher asks the following questions. Do you agree that $5 is way too much for a simple cup of coffee? You talked about this in your breakout room as well. Keeping in mind, guys, the wording of questions is the most important influence on answers given to a sample survey. It can lead to response bias. Confusing or leading questions can introduce strong bias. If my son was out late, now granted he's 10, but if my son was out late and came home and I said, Anders, why were you late? Versus, Anders, you were late because you were out doing this, this, and this, weren't you? Okay, he's gonna respond differently to my tone of voice, how I asked it, right? The way we word questions can heavily influence a response. We need to watch out for that. Under coverage. Under coverage is another type of sampling error that can happen. A sample leaves out a group of people from a population. Here's an example of this. You work for a banky com baking company, excuse me, and you're interested in how often families bake during the week. 
You randomly, so that's good, randomly call 300 households from 8 to 5 p.m. on Wednesday to obtain the results. How is this bias? Ladies and gentlemen, they are leaving out everyone who goes to work. Now, granted, in COVID times, people are going to be home from 8 to 5, but think pre-COVID. People left their house to go to work, to go to school, so on and so forth. These, this is going to give us biased results due to under coverage. Let's keep cruising. A bad sampling frame can also lead to bias. A sampling frame is the list of a population from where we get our sample. So for example, if I wanted to interview 100 students at Armstrong High School, right? I need to get those names. Like I need to find out who those 100 people are. So I'm going to get a list of that of those 100 people. Well, where am I going to get the list? Could I get the list? Could I go to the yearbook and get names from the yearbook and randomly get a sample that way? I sure could, but that might produce under coverage. Who am I going to leave out? I might leave out anyone who just moved into the district, right? That could create under coverage. Where would a better list come from? Probably the guidance office where they can update the latest roster for me. So you can see here, guys, we have our population, right? Then we get that list, okay? And from that list, hopefully it has everyone in the population. If it doesn't, there's some under coverage there. It's leaving people out. But from that list then, I take that sample. So that is that sampling frame there. Oops, I already talked about that. Let's move on. Non-sampling errors, those can occur after the survey has been given. So one of those is response bias. This is a systematic pattern of incorrect responses. This is often where people lie or answer the question incorrect based on wording. People often lie about personal and illegal or unethical activities. For example, teenage alcohol use, that is illegal. It's also not healthy for you, right? In the best surveys done, my personal opinion is I would agree, let's say I found a certain X percentage of teens in the state of Minnesota drink this often. I would expect that percentage maybe to be up just a little bit. Although students might admit to it and feel comfortable admitting, they maybe don't admit how much. Maybe they said they did it once in a month, but they actually did it two or three times. So they didn't want to admit to that two or three. They felt comfortable enough to admit it, just not how often. People lie about personal and illegal or unethical activities. Now, again, when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about all people. Just remember, keep that in mind, okay? Non-response bias is individuals chosen for the sample can't be contacted or just refuse to participate. Someone knocks at your door, or calls you on the phone, wants you to participate in a survey, and you say no. That's just called non-response bias. We're leaving out some people, but because of this non-response bias, they don't, want, they don't want to answer or they don't want to be found. And that is it for the day, you guys. A nice 13 minute video, quickly wrapped it up. I know I went a little fast, but hopefully you feel okay about it. You guys have a great day and we will chat with you soon.